Hello and welcome back to Measure Theory. First, as always, let me thank all the nice supporters on Steady. I am very happy to see that we have already reached part 10. And today we will do my favorite theorem in the integration theory. And this is Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. Indeed, the name is quite fitting because it is as before a convergence theorem and something has to dominate the given function. We call a convergence theorem tells you when you can pull in a limit into the integral. It turns out that this convergence theorem that is named after Lebesgue is very useful and you can apply it very often. Before I state the theorem, let me first start by introducing some notations. As always, we choose a measure space, so a set x, a sigma algebra a, and a measure mu. Now we define a set of Lebesgue integrable functions. Therefore, we use this curved L. Most of the time, the set x and the sigma algebra are so fixed in the context that only the measure can vary, and therefore I just use mu here in the notation. In other cases, you would write the whole measure space here inside. The set is now defined as the set of all Lebesgue integrable functions. Now the functions should be defined on X and have values in R. You could also generalize that to complex values in the end, but that's not so hard indeed. The important thing, however, is that they are measurable. Now remember, we defined the integral for non-negative functions. And for that reason, I look at the integral for the absolute value of f. This is a non-negative function and we know it's still measurable. So we can look at the integral. We know this exists in all cases, but in the worst case, it could be infinity. Hence, integrable in this sense means it's not infinity, which means less than infinity. Okay, so this is the important set here, the set of Lebesgue integrable functions in this sense. Maybe I should give you a small remark here. Totally unnecessary in this context, but it will be important later. There you will be interested in the power for which the function is integrable. This means that you have here the exponent, the power 1, and you also put it on the L. In short, you then call it just the L1 space. For such functions, you can also define the integral just by looking at the positive and the negative part here separately. This means that for f in our L1 space, we write the function f as the combination of two non-negative functions. And I call this first one f plus and the second one f minus. And the combination is given by a minus sign. Yeah, and the idea is f plus, f minus are non-negative. Okay, maybe a short picture for this. If this is the graph of the function f, then this part here is the graph of our function f plus. And of course, this part here then is the graph corresponding to f minus, it's not exactly f minus, this would be minus f minus. However, obviously adding both these functions gives you back our original f. Now you may immediately believe me that for all functions f you can split them up into these two parts. In the positive part above the x-axis and the negative part below the x-axis. We have to do this because we only define the integral for non-negative functions, as you remember. The idea is then, I have an integral for f plus, and also an integral for f minus, and then I will subtract the areas. Then I don't get out the area, but I get out an orientated area, where I subtract the parts that lie below the x-axis. This is the integral notion we want, and we also have this for the Riemann integral, as you remember. Hence, therefore, the definition is given as the following symbol, the integral over x for the function f 
the mu defined as the well-defined integral of f plus as a non-negative function minus the well-defined value for the integral f minus. Both parts have a positive value and we also know it's finite yeah, by this assumption here. Therefore the subtraction is no problem at all, we get out a real number in the end. Okay, now you know what the integral symbol is for measurable functions with real values. I skipped some details for the definition of f plus and f minus because I think the picture is sufficient here. Okay, now I can finally state Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. What we need here is a sequence of functions and I call it fn defined on x and they can have real values now. And of course they should be measurable. Of course you can visualize this always as a sequence of graphs. So this would be f1 and then the next thing would be here as f2 and then here f3 and so on. For such a sequence of functions you can always ask about the pointwise limit. This means that you fix a point x on the x-axis and look at the values for the functions. So you have one value here, the next one here, so you get out a normal sequence of real numbers. Therefore you can ask what happens with this normal sequence of numbers. If it is convergent, you get out a limit, well, which is then a point here. In the case you can do this for all x here, you get out a lot of points here, and indeed you get out a new graph, and therefore a new function. And this is the pointwise limit function, and we will call it just f here. And this is what I will also want to put into the assumptions of our theorem here. This means that we also have our function f here, also with real values and the following property. If we fix a point x for all our functions fn, then this should be convergent to f of x. And I told you we want this property for all x on the x-axis, so for all lowercase x in our capital X. However, you know we are in the realm of measure theory. This means we don't need this property exactly everywhere. It's sufficient that we have it almost everywhere. Almost always means with respect to our measure mu here. And in short, we write this as mu almost everywhere. Please recall that this means exactly that the set where this does not hold is a set of measure zero. So mu of the set is equal to zero. Okay, so until now the assumptions are not so strange. You have a sequence of measurable functions and also the pointwise limit of this sequence. And now you could ask a lot of questions. Are the functions fn integrable? So do they lie in our L1 space? And if they do, what about our pointwise limit function f then? And more importantly, can I swap the limit and the integral? Or in other words, can I pull in the limit into the integral? Now Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem says yes to all of these questions. If we add one more assumption. And this is where the dominated comes into the play we have that the absolute value of all these functions is bounded by a function g. Of course you should read this point wisely. So if you put in an x here, this inequality holds. The function g now has the property that it's integrable, which means it comes from our L1 space. And obviously it should be the same g for all n. Now this g is what one usually calls an integrable major end. So this is what Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem indeed needs. It needs an integrable major end. So a function that lies above all the other functions here. 
This means it's not important what exactly the function g is. You only need this inequality and you need that it's integrable. From these two properties now all the other things follow. For example, if you know that g has a finite integral, then all the other functions should be also integrable. Okay, so let's write that down as the implication of the theorem. All the functions f1, f2, f3 and so on lie in our L1 space. And we can say the same for our pointwise limit function f. Of course we know it should be measurable as a limit, but it's also integrable. Now let's look at the integrals. We know for all fn the integral will exist and defines a real number. Therefore we have here a new sequence of real numbers and we can ask what is the limit? And the answer is you can pull the limit inside and there we have our pointwise limit of fn, so this is what we called f. And that's now Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. As a convergence theorem, it tells you when you are allowed to push the limit inside the integral. And here you see, you just have to find a suitable function g, nothing more. And that is the reason why this theorem is so useful and you can apply it very often. Okay, I hope you're also intrigued by the theorem as much as I am and that you will watch the next video in the series where I, of course, show you the whole proof of this dominated convergence theorem. And after this, I can show you a lot of examples where Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem is very important. Okay, thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Bye.